do they get like is it a is it one for, like do you just get to write off a hundred thousand dollars or how, how does it work you write off a hundred thousand off your taxable income it's not going to save you a hundred grand in tax your tax savings is going to be your tax deduction times your tax rate so there's a difference there's two things that you can look at one are deductions which is what depreciation is depreciation is a deduction of your taxable income Thank you for joining me on the Investing for Freedom podcast. Today, we've got a guest who I've been waiting for a long time to have this conversation. We've got Mr. Kevin Schneider from Pine & Co. CPAs, and I'm really excited about this. And I'll tell you, just being you know completely open, we were actually scheduled to do a conversation in the Freedom Elite community, and we decided to pivot here. And so we're recording a podcast. So you know, for, for me, um, the organic podcasts are probably the best. And so I didn't give, I didn't, I didn't give Kevin any time for, to prepare for the podcast. So um, we should get it raw. We should get it real. And we'll get to see um, how amazing this guy is on his feet. So Kevin, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, so I love that preface there. So give me a lot of grace here. I have no copy points. Like you said, it's raw, but with tax, there's so much to cover in tax. I'm sure we'll have a good combo. Yeah, and I, again, I just don't think that there's, you know, a better conversation to be having than tax. And I think, you know, I heard I heard somebody say a long time ago, the, the greatest way to make more money is to keep more of what you're already making. And I think mm -hmm. this is such a point that so many people still to this day, I think sometimes we get in our little, as we were talking off, uh, off camera, we get in our little echo chambers and we think that because, you know, I get to talk to amazing people like you um, regularly that everybody just knows, you know, the tax benefit and the tax code and all the opportunities. And there's still just so many people that just have no idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing in the, in the market, and this is just general across CPAs kind of, this is kind of painting a broad brush. But CPAs tend to, like you said, get in their echo chamber. We're head down. We're in our caves. We got our calculator. We are just going to town with tax returns. We're just trying to keep up with the workload. And so a lot of CPAs are caught in that mindset and they're unable to step out and proactively look of what's coming up in tax law. What's coming up with my client base? If new tax law changes comes through, do I have a segment of my clients who that will affect and I can reach out to? And that proactive planning is much needed. And, you know, like what you were saying, keeping your money um, in your pocket to be able to redistribute into another investment, um, to provide even provide for your family, whatever that is, you can utilize the tax code to snowball that. And a lot of people miss out on this is where we want to invest into things. We want to grow our net worth. We want to grow um, our portfolios, but maybe we can get into some tax advantageous investments to which we can invest that capital, get a return on it, but at the same time, reduce our tax bill. And in order to do that, you got to be proactive, you got to be intentional. And there's so many ways to do that. And that's kind of what me and my partner, Mike, love to do is just uh, dive into our client situation, see what they're ex passionate and excited about. Is it real estate? Is it oil and gas? Is it crypto? Whatever it is that drives your passion invest along with your passion and we'll see along along the way how do we harvest some tax breaks yeah it's such a it's such a critical crucial thing to it so i i'm going to ask you one of the questions that i always ask everybody and i'll just i'm going to ask it in a little different way so usually sure. the question is what is the piece of advice you find yourself sharing the most but i'm going to i'm going to put a little twist on it so what is maybe one or two maybe even three of the top tax pieces of advice that you find yourself really being able to just right off the bat um, help with your new clients? For, from a CPA standpoint, it is always trying to first, you have to develop a diagnosis of sorts, kind of like a doctor. So when a new client walks in, my first piece of advice is, do we have a clear picture of your tax footprint? Because I can't help and I can't strategize if you have a mess of a situation to where you got income coming from all these different places, deductions coming from all, you know, we have to make a clear plan and a clear start. Mm -hmm. And so what I like to do with my clients is just sit down and say, tell me where, where's your income coming from? What are you passionate about? And then how, how do I educate? Cause I'm an educated kind of like, a, I like to teach a lot with my clients. I, I like when clients blindly follow me, but at the same time, I want them to understand and take ownership and hold them accountable for their decision making. And that takes education. Mm 
because I can tell you to, this will save you in taxes. This will save you in taxes. Um, but if you don't understand the why or the purpose or the long vision, then it's going to fall flat. So, you know, if you're a business owner, um, fine tuning your business. If you're a consultant, if you're a realtor, if you're whatever line of business you're in, if you feel the, if you feel money, leave your pocket, or you, if you, if you feel some energy, leave your pocket or leave your, I guess, leave your business. Something is happening to where you are losing something for your business, whether financial, emotional, anything along those lines, we want to tap into that and say, what is that? Because that is likely a tax deduction. And it's kind of weird that I would say the emotional piece, but there's so many times where you're driving, you're traveling, long nights, these things that there's so many hidden tax breaks and all of that to where you may not feel all this money leave your pocket, but there's ways to capture tax savings mm. um, by just understanding your situation. And that's where a big part of tax planning is for my business owners is just what am I doing to make money? <laughs> Hopefully you got that down, but then what am I doing to try to grow my business? And that's cash infusion, expensing, advertising, whatever it is. Then we can even take a step further back and say, is there anything outside my business that I can probably funnel through my business to save on taxes? Common one is vehicles. I mean, that's a no brainer. If you, if you drive anywhere and you have a business more than likely there's a tax break out there, whether it be mileage or depreciation. And that's a common one. Honestly, some people just drive and they just write it. They don't even think about it. They mm. just do the work. And then you got to tap into those questions and say, are you traveling a lot? Are you driving a lot? Um, cell phone, internet, all these small things that we kind of pick up on, they'll kind of add up to a big pot. So even though it may sound kind of yeah, immaterial in nature saying, I got a $200 cell phone bill. whoop de doo Well, we got a $200 cell phone bill. We got a $200 internet bill. Oh, do you see clients at your house? Oh, okay. You got a maid, you have an HOA fee. Do you have a pool? I mean, mm -hmm. I even have, I've written off pools before because there's entertainment at the house or um, I have a guy who's a pool. He has a pool company. He redid his whole backyard. It's a showroom. Yeah. And so we got to expense a pretty hefty backyard remodel. So it's just understanding what is your business and then what can we do creatively to start deducting more inside that business. So that's my big, I guess, starting point with a lot of self-employed people. Yeah. I remember when I lived in Nevada, which I mean, this was probably 20, 2011, 2012. I did this. We had a kitchen and bath remodeling company and I built, I had the guys build this outdoor area. I had an outdoor pizza oven, concrete oh, yeah. countertops, like, and you know, we deducted the whole thing and literally clients would go to my house. I'd call Kara and I'd be like, Hey, we've got a customer that's <laughs> going to be poking around the backyard, but you know, it was like a, it was like a built-in showroom. So, yeah. but you know, these are the things that most people don't think about. And so I appreciate you sharing it. So yeah. I'm curious, um, who's had the greatest impact on your life? Oh, wow. Um, the easiest answer is my wife. Um, just from an overall standpoint, she shows me so much grace, so much um, so much support. And we've been through a lot together. And so my spouse is my best friend. And she is a tremendous, you know, owning a, a small business, um, small accounting firm. I mean, there's trials, there's seasonal ups and downs. And um, she's so supportive in that. And my harebrained ideas with the business, with our finances, with our investing strategy, whatever it is, she's really supportive. And she just, without her, I wouldn't be able to really function at the level I do. Mm. Um, and so it's just, it's really is a team effort. And, you know, she's not even on the firm website you know, and yeah. she's not a technically an employee, but she's one of the most influential people at the firm, whether people want to even know it or not, because she's what keeps me going. Yeah. I love yeah. it. That's yeah. uh, I, I usually, <laughs> I usually lead with that question. I kind of threw you a little curveball there. We're like deep talking about taxes. And then it's like, who's the most impactful person? <laughs> Who are um, you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm curious, talk to me a little bit about your journey. What was, what was like your, I guess the the moment where you decided I'm not going to go down the traditional bookkeeper, tax preparer, CPA road. I'm going to go help people, you know, really learn to keep more of their wealth and mm -hmm. and be more of a wealth strategist. Explain and kind of walk me through that. Yeah, I so I started off my career in auditing. 
financial bookkeeping. Like I would go to client's office and literally count pieces of parts for inventory analysis. Drive me nuts. Hated it. Didn't want to ever do it again. So I got that out of the way. Because when you become a CPA, you really have two routes. You either go accounting or tax. And I mean, there's some different areas too, but those are the two main roads you go down. So I went down the first path, dead end for me, pivot to tax. Tax actually started clicking with me and I was able to really get passionate about it. I mean, the tax code is very complex. It's very... Uh, there's 9,000 pages of the IRS code. It's impossible to know it all. Mm. And when you first start and get your training wheels kind of in the tax world, you kind of get overwhelmed. And you're literally as a tax staff person, you're trying to put the W-2 number on the right line. That's my goal. Then it starts clicking a little bit. Now you, you start piecing together business income coming in, passive income coming in, dividends, interest, portfolio income. Then you start to see this puzzle start to build itself. And the first time you give advice and you get that sincere thank you, like you saved me so much in tax. That's what it drove me. And so that's what really started getting me passionate about what I do is just helping families. And I mean, I don't have a ton of like high, high net worth people. I really am a CPA to people who make $80,000 a year to people who make, you know, 8 million a year. I mean, I have do have a broad range, but most of my clients sit between probably $200,000 of income and $700,000 of income. Hmm. Um, and you can have a lot of impact um, in that in that bracket range is because the tax code's actually written to pun- penalize the wealthy. So when you get really, really wealthy and you start getting that high income, it's really hard to, t- it's not, it's, it's, it's just, you have to be more creative in your tax planning just because that's the way the code is kind of written. Um, that middle, middle class is kind of the sweet spot to where you can really impact lives and a $50,000 refund could change someone's life. Um, and so that's what really started getting me passionate. And then just seeing the underserved market, you know, from a business standpoint, just looking at my career trajectory and what the market needs, trying to fulfill the market and having a need that you're fulfilling and that's just security and, 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 in my firm. And so that's kind of, it's kind of two, two edged sword there. I love people. That is what drives me, but there's a tremendous amount of underservice in the tax planning realm. Yeah. What are, what are you seeing out there right now? Like, I, I know there's been a lot of changes and, and speculation, and we kind of talked about this a little bit off camera, but what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing right now? And, and maybe it's, you know, partially tax and, and other, other challenges as well, but what are you seeing? From an account, from a business owner standpoint, it's just finding good people, motivated people, that's been a challenge and going to this virtual environment uh, that we're in. I mean, I have employees now all over the country, which has opened up a door of state tax issues that I'm not used to, but also management issues. How do you manage someone fully remote, make them feel part of the culture, make them feel a part of the team to where they are bought into your firm, even though they're across the country. So we're getting better at that. Um, You know, when COVID hit, we were already in the cloud, so we didn't really miss a beat. When it came to that, when we couldn't go into office or anything like that. So the actual logistics of working um, remotely or having employees across the country is not a big issue for us. But what it is, is the cultural, the um, making sure that they're supported and that they feel a part of the team. So that's been one hurdle um, as a business owner. But I, I would say from a tax standpoint, I'm, I am still seeing a lot of growth in real estate. That's where a bulk of my clients are. Just because bonus depreciation currently is 80% for 2023, which is still really good. So for 2022, from 2017 to 2022, we had 100% bonus depreciation. Uh, So in that, this doesn't just affect real estate, but any business owner who's buying assets, you know, equipment, computers, manufacturing equipment, vehicles, even if they're over 6,000 pounds, bonus depreciation is a huge deal. So real estate's been really good for the past five years because of bonus depreciation. Now that we're starting to see that kind of fade down, uh, we're going to see a 20% drop in bonus depreciation for the next five years. So it's still at 80%, but it's still really good. And so people are still passionate about real estate. I'm seeing a lot of clients buy real estate. It's a huge tax planning um, opportunity. But as bonus depreciation starts to dwindle down, I would anticipate, depending on what interest rates are going to be doing, but I would say even with bonus depreciation going down, real estate would still be a good investment from a tax standpoint. And I won't go into all the meat and potatoes of kind of how it all works unless you want me to. (laughs) It might be kind of boring, but I can if you want of why. But the big crux of it is there's so many ways to 
chop and dice up real estate and the tax side of things that even if you don't have this huge bonus depreciation, you still have section 179 and you can still change the class life of your real estate into shorter depreciable lifespans to getting a higher depreciation expense, even if it, there's no bonus. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up too, because like when you look backwards, I mean, depreciation over, you know, 30 years, I'll just grab the, the middle number there. That's yeah. great. Like that's fantastic. We just love depreciation, mm -hmm. but then, you know, bonus depreciation comes along and we get used to bonus bonus depreciation. And then it's like, when that goes away, like we're no longer, we're no longer happy with just regular old depreciation. And so it's kind of funny just even hearing you say that because so many people are like, you know, again, just not, but I mean, just depreciation in itself over the full life of that building is amazing. Can you touch on depreciation in general, just from a high level? Yeah. So what depreciation is, is you're getting a tax deduction for the wear and tear of that asset. So in real estate, for example, you buy a rental property, the IRS is going to put useful lives on all your any if anything has a useful life of longer than a year a computer real estate car you know we're not talking paper clips and light bulbs here but we're talking big assets that have a useful life of greater than a year the irs has designated useful life tables for these assets so if you buy a residential rental property the depreciable life on that's 27 and a half years so all that means is you have to you take the value of the house or what you not the value but the cost you divide it by 27.5 minus the land because land's non depreciable so 27.5 divided and you divide that into the uh, cost of the building and you get that as an expense each year for the next 27 years. And that's just to account for the useful, or I guess the deterioration of a rental property, because it's, if you don't touch it, an asset, it's going to eventually turn to dust. I mean, that's just the, you know, the way of the world. So there's always repairs. There's always, you always got to, you know, paint and all this kind of stuff, but you're, you're going to get that depreciation expense, even though the value of that house is appreciating, you're getting a depreciation expense expense, even though the value is hopefully going up. If you made a good investment into a rental property, that rental property is going up in value, but your taxes should be going down with that depreciation. And we see this a lot. And here's what's cool about bonus is let's say it's November and you're self-employed and you want to, you want, you want to just hammer at your tax bill. Well, depreciation is, it doesn't matter with depreciation if you buy that asset in cash or with debt. So wherever you lay on the kind of the spectrum of debt in, let's say it's November and you're business owner and you have an $80,000 tax bill sitting out there or $80,000, not tax bill, but $80,000 net income. And you want to hammer that away. You could go buy a hundred thousand dollar truck and not saying this is, might be the most financial astute plan, but Theoretically, here's how it could work. You can go buy a hundred thousand dollar truck in November, and as long as it's over six thousand pounds, you're gonna get eighty percent of that as depreciation, eighty percent bonus. So eighty percent of a hundred thousand is eighty thousand. So place that truck in service. You're gonna get all of that in one year. That's the bonus. You're not gonna depreciate it over its useful life of five years. Instead, you're gonna get all of it in one year. So now your net income is zero. But on that truck, you can finance that over five years. So you're not out the door cash a hundred K. You might be out the door cash twenty K, and then you could finance over five five years, then your tax bill goes to zero. So you save probably 30K by putting 20K down on a truck. But then in the in years two through five, you're going to be making those note payments and there's not going to be a corresponding tax deduction there anymore because you've already depreciated the vehicle. The interest is deductible, but not the not the actual truck anymore. So you got to be aware of that, that if you take bonus depreciation on, a, on an asset that you financed, you're going to get the deduction one year. Then as you make the note payments in the future years, your cash is actually not going to match your tax now. More cash is going to go out the door, but your tax liability is not going down because we already took the depreciation, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What What's your thoughts on, and I guess just perspective, we talk about getting on this perpetual bonus depreciation hamster wheel. Just touch <laughs> on like, you know, bonus, I, I guess, depreciation recapture. What are some of the pitfalls that you guys see and, and just, you know, probably should um, warn about? Yeah. So I actually had a conversation with a client this morning. He has five rental properties that that he's taken bonus depreciation on and now he wants to sell all five. Huge tax liability sitting out there for that. And that to your point, that's what depreciation recapture is. So let's say depreciation recapture, all that says is if you buy a rental property, the useful life is 27 and a half years. If you take, let's say the rental property was 500,000. Let's say you took accelerated depreciation or bonus depreciation of 200,000. That 200,000 is a tax benefit that should have been spread out over 27 years. The IRS just lets you do it in one year. Mm -hmm. So if you sell that property in year five, you have to recapture that 22 years of bonus depreciation that it should have been over its straight line 
if that kind of makes sense. So recapture has a flat tax rate though of 25%. So what I was talking with my client this morning was he's in the highest tax bracket and he's making a million plus a year and he's going to increase and have more taxable income this year. But the depreciation recapture is going to have that flat rate of 25% where he got all the bonus depreciation at the tax rate of 37%. So he got the deduction at 37%. He recaptures it at 25. So it still works out okay, but you can always 1030. We talked about 1031 exchanges, how to complete completely defer the tax, even the depreciation recapture. So there's ways, so many ways to do it. I, I have a question just, and I know this, I mean, we could go down a rabbit hole. So I'm going to try to <laughs> put it in a, in a simple perspective or, or situation, but like, let's just take a vehicle. Yeah. Um, and you and I've talked about like Turo and the vehicle funds and, and some of this other stuff, but let's say that I have a hundred thousand dollar vehicle and just for, I, I know we can't do this anymore because we're in 80% bonus depreciation territory, but let's just say it could be a hundred. Um, if somebody like depreciated a vehicle a hundred percent, so it's a hundred thousand dollars, they depreciated a hundred percent. Do they get like, is it a, is it one for like, do you just get to write off a hundred thousand dollars or how, do, how does it work? You write off a hundred thousand off your taxable income. It's not going to save you a hundred grand in tax. Your tax savings is going to be your tax deduction times your tax rate. So there's a difference. There's two things that you can look at. One are deductions, which is what depreciation is. Depreciation is a deduction of your taxable income. So if you had a hundred, if you had, like in our example, you had $80,000 of net income in your business, in order to pay zero tax on that, you have to come up with $80,000 of expenses, which could be a hundred thousand dollar truck at 80% bonus. There's also credits. Credits are a lot different than deductions. Credits are a dollar for dollar credit to your tax liability. They're a lot stronger than deductions. So a $20,000 deduction is going to save you maybe $8,000 in tax. A $20,000 credit is going to save you $20,000 in tax. So there's a lot of credits sitting out there, especially in the in the vehicle world of electric vehicles, the Teslas, and you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, they really, they put some guardrails on kind of how to take those credits, but, and they put income limits on it. So again, the wealthy kind of get a slap on the wrist. You can't go buy, you know, you used to not have an income cap, but now you do. You have an adjusted gross income cap. So you can't be making a million dollars and go buy a Tesla and get the credit. It's for that sweet spot I was talking about earlier. The credit's available to those people. But there's credits to anything. You know, I'm kind of going off tangent, but like solar. So a lot in real estate, my partner did this kind of with the financing aspect. He went and put solar panels on his house for $100,000 cost, you know, totally off the grid, battery powered, whatever. $100,000 was the total cost, including labor and install and all that. There was a 30% credit for that. So he had a $30,000 credit, solar solar credit that goes, that's like a $30,000 payment to the IRS. He financed that at one and a half percent interest over 20 years. So he put $0 down because he did this in like October, November. He didn't even start making payments till the next tax year. And the government gave him $30,000 credit to his tax liability just by doing solar. And you could do this for rental properties. If you have a rental property, you could put a Tesla charging station. Those are credits. You can look at these creative things. So he got off the grid. His monthly payment on this, that his interest rate he got was like, it's like 400 bucks a month. That's what his electric bill was anyway. He's paying his electric bill. And instead of paying an electric bill, he's paying a solar note. And he got a $30,000 credit. With no money down. No money down. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's crazy, man. That's a credit. Yeah. That's a credit. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question for you that has, I, I just, I'm curious of your perspective on this. So, you know, there's been all this conversation about the IRS and, and budgets and more agents and all, you know, just all mm -hmm. the things. What What's your, like, what's kind of your perspective on this? And and is that targeted more toward like, um, I don't want to put you in a weird spot here, but is that targeted more toward like a certain, you know, type of tax return? Is there anything we can do to, uh, to avoid that? Or is this just the IRS just keeping up with growth? Yeah. Uh, well, when 2020 hit COVID, the first thing they did was let go of agents. They couldn't do field work. So the IRS actually couldn't not go to businesses and audit. Mm. So they let them go for budgetary reasons. When they started to recover, the economy opened up, everything started getting back to normal. They just hired 80 some odd thousand agents. My experience to date is that these are very green agents. <laughs> Like you can talk circles around them and I hope they don't listen to this and come target me. But they, the audits I've been through have been so simple. Uh, they, they would ask complex questions coming from their supervisor. Then you just give them the, I mean, they don't even know what they're asking. They're, they're kind of my experience with that level is they've been very new. So my audits haven't been intense. And also my audit rates are still down. I probably did 
three audits last year. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's still not a lot. And we have 500 plus client and they have up to three years to audit you. So we get it really, we get aggressive with our tax plan because the IRS code is very gray. It's not black and white. I can make an argument and then I can make a, a defense out of anything as so long as it's reasonable and it has some sort of reasoning, yeah, just reasoning to it. If it's just not outlandish cheating, I'm not going to lose my license. I'm not going to get penalized. You're not going to get penalized. If we make a good faith effort reading the tax code and interpret, interpreting it in a different way, then the IRS is they might challenge us, but we come to the, we come to, come to bat with a defense. And so uh, audits, I'm not scared of. We do our due diligence. We make sure we understand the tax rules. That's where my education piece comes in. I want to make sure you understand the tax strategy laid before you and that you're enacting, make sure you understand the rules, make sure you understand the impact of it. And then if you're audited, it's just kind of a nuisance. I just got to present them the work that we've already done on the back end. And so mm-hmm. I'm not scared of them. Uh, and the audits I've had have actually been quite easy, but I would anticipate them to eventually catch up. But that's that's how the government makes money. I mean, and the sad thing is uh, what we see a lot is the IRS, they, they're kind of bullies. They're, they are. And that's why I love my job too. I love kind of beating them up and when I can. And so they go after lower income people who can't afford representation. It's yeah. cheap. I hate it. They, they know that someone making $60,000 self-employed and they have a lot of travel, a lot of meals. They probably don't have a bookkeeper. They probably don't have receipts. They probably can't afford a CPA to even represent them in the audit because it might be a $5,000, $10,000 audit. So they know that it's just low hanging fruit. And yeah. so it's my partner and I've actually uh, kicked around um, opening up some sort of charitable. If we can get to a point where we can get that, we want to be develop like a charitable um, representation for the lower class. And so just so they stop bullying it. And yeah. it's just sad because I see that a lot. People come into the office and when they get slapped with an audit. They panic. Anything with the IRS incites fear. Mm-hmm. And they don't know what to do. And they come to a CPA and we're like, yeah, here's, here's our bill rates. And they're like, I can't, I can't. And I, you know, I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, get a little transparent here, but when I lived in Nevada and this wasn't the IRS, I do have an IRS story, but this was the state taxation department. And I remember I was out of town. I was on a trip and my wife, uh, Kara, she was doing the bookkeeping at that point in time. And she calls me up and she's like, Hey, the taxation department's here and they want to do an audit. And they like basically moved into our office for like Mm. four days. And she was so stressed out, Kevin, like, and I'm like, Hey, like we didn't do anything wrong, but like, it just, like you said, it incited fear. Mm -hmm. And we went through this three or four day audit. And by the time it was done, they actually owed us like $18,000. And you know, the crazy thing is, is like, if I owed them $18,000, it'd be like penalties, interest, you pay tomorrow or you're going to prison. Yeah. But it took like nine months for me to get my money from these guys. But like, to your point of like inciting fear, it's just, and it's easy. Like when you talk about that low hanging fruit, that was really what I was curious about. Like, I mean, I think they target people that they know are probably not Mm going to put up a fight. Yeah. We've seen it time and time again. And it's, it's sad. I don't know if I don't know how the IRS system because a lot of it's automated. A lot of audits are just automated. You submit a tax return, the IRS is going to put you through a system and kind of judge based on your income range, based on what you your your forms that you filed. Are you in range with the majority of the country? If the majority of the country are self-employed Schedule C's making a hundred grand on their Schedule C, how much travel is reasonable? Maybe probably ten, eight thousand. If you have 50, that's going to be the red flag. So you want to be, you know, but if it's legit, we're not scared of the audit again, but it's, it's a lot of the audits start off automated. They'll just send you a notice saying, Hey, I got your tax return. Thanks for that. Before we issue the refund or before we process the tax return, we want you to provide the backup for your travel expenses, send that in and it could open the scope to more. But, and that's what you want to be careful. If you ever go through an audit, you never, you want to provide exactly what they tell you. If they say, I want to see these bank statements, you send them those bank statements and you don't send them anything else. Because if you send them another bank account on accident or all your accounts at, in one PDF file or whatever, they had now can open the scope to everything. They can, you don't want them looking. Um, even, I mean, you're not doing anything shady, but still you don't want to open the scope of an audit for no reason. So you want, that's why representation is very important is because we know how to handle the audits. We know how to discuss, we could talk nerd IRS code and we can get to the point really quick, but also we're going to help shield you from the stress, the fear, and also just opening the scope of an audit by being smart about how we present information. Yeah. And I'm, man, I, I learned this lesson a long time ago. Like, <laughs> Um, I, I mentioned the IRS thing. I, I had this situation in 2000, I want to say 2000, it was 2007. We had a gold mine that we were doing a lot of work for and the gold mine went bankrupt. They had a whole bunch of like 
um, environmental issues and couldn't produce gold. And so anyway, they owed us a whole bunch of money, make a long story short. Um, they owed us over $400,000, which was a ton of money for, you know, our company at that point in yeah. time. And, um, it put me in a situation where I was getting, I was late on some payroll taxes and some different issues and man, here comes the IRS like knocking. And I was dude, they, I mean, they're bullies. Like you said, yeah. this is, this is no joke. If Kara was sitting here right now, she would tell you this actually happened. We're sitting across from an IRS agent and, and I'm like, you know, we got to figure out some kind of payment plan, whatever. And she looks at us and she told my wife, well, she looked at me and she said, listen, the IRS doesn't care how you pay us. I don't care if you have to go sell your wife's body. The IRS will get paid. She said that to us. Wow. And I was like, I know. I'm like, what? Wow. When you talk about bullies, like I was scared. I mean, I was scared. And I talked to a mentor of mine and he's like, go get a tax attorney. And so I went and got a tax attorney. This was before I you know, really figured out that I needed a good CPA and, mm -hmm. and all of you guys in my world. I went and found a tax attorney and he said, don't talk to him anymore. All correspondence goes through me. Dude, that was the best day of my life when I found a professional like you guys, like you and Mike and, and just said, and, and that was a tax attorney because it was already, you know, so far gone, but mm -hmm. being able to just like hand it over to guys like you, well, guys or girls um, <laughs> like you and, and just not stress about it. Cause you guys are so good at what you do. And I think so many people miss that until it's too late as the boat that I was in, uh, it was too late to fix whatever had been done, but at least turning it over to, you know, a, a sophisticated, educated, knowledge, experienced team member like Pine and Co. Um, I will, I'll, I'll never, I'll never skimp on legal and CPA fees ever again mm -hmm. in my life. Yeah. And that's, it's kind of, I, we see that a lot too, because it could be sticker shock when you actually transfer from a, like an H&R block, self-prepare, TurboTax, you're like, oh, I'm going to save as much money. And over here, you're missing out on so much just by opening the pocket a little bit and investing. It's, and that's how we, I view myself and uh, Everyone who works at our firm views ourselves as an investment. You're 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 investing in a strategy that's going to pay a dividend or a multiple of our fees. So if you if my tax return costs five thousand dollars, yeah, it could be a sticker shot. But hopefully along that way, we've done planning and we've saved you a hundred k in tax. You know, I'm CPAs aren't the best fit for everybody. You know, especially when you're in that low income range because you may not get that ROI. If you get a CPA that costs five hundred bucks, you might get that kind of service. Same thing with you know. Um, you know, cars. It's like you buy a cheap car. Don't be shocked if it breaks down, doesn't work the way you want it. So you get what you pay for, but it should be providing a return. And that's how we always view ourselves as an investment. Yeah. So that's a good, yeah. I agree hundred percent. Okay. Comment, maybe a question, and then I'll, I'll throw, um, throw it back to you. Um, I'm long America right now. I really am. Like, I think there's so many, you know, indicators, things going on in the world. You know, there's, there's a bunch of different camps, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm pro America. I'm, I'm long America. I think we're going to be just fine. I read an article, I think it was last week that Mexico just passed China as the number one exporter to the United States of America. So we are now buying more from Mexico um, than we are China. And so I've been thinking about this from a perspective of, you know, just opportunity. I think of it through the lens of opportunity, but I kind of want to bring it from a lens of like growth business and ultimately tax when we think about depreciation and real estate and, and business, et cetera. I've been thinking about this. If my wife and I have actually been thinking about investing in Mexico city because we love it. And mm -hmm. I actually think that Mexico is going to continue to um, be in more and more of a player in, in the world stage. And then I see an article like this um, and it was in CNBC or something. So it's not like some off you know thing. But when I think about all of this, I've been thinking about what happened during COVID and, you know, more manufacturing happening in Mexico. And as much as we would love manufacturing to be primarily done in the United States of America, I don't know that we're ever going to fully be competitive on the manufacturing front um, and with labor, et cetera. But I do believe that, you know, more assembly is going to start happening in the United States, more, you know, warehousing, storage, industrial distribution, vehicles, all of the above. And so I, again, I'm long America. I'm, I'm long, you know, real estate infrastructure infrastructure investment. I'm curious what you think about it. And then from a tax perspective, so maybe it's a twofold question from a tax perspective, what do you see coming? Um, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but if you did, um, what major changes do you think are coming? Do you think that we're going to remain pro-business, pro, you know, tax savings for business owners, et cetera? What, what do you see in all of this? Yeah, without getting political, uh, I've already seen some Republican articles with bonus depreciation uh, being re-upped to 100%. So whoever, whoever takes that stand, I'm voting for all the CPAs will rejoice. There'll be parties in the streets. And that is what I want. 100% bonus, um, as long as the candidate's not a, a lunatic. So 
that that I've already seen articles written on that. But the government and the IRS always incentivize. Look at the IRS code. Look where it tries to lead you, because the IRS code is written in order to incentivize what the government wants you to do. So that might sound creepy. <laughs> it might sound a little off-putting, but look at it this way. The government wants you to invest in America. Like you want to invest in America. Now, investing in Mexico could have great financial could have great financial impact for you. Could be a great business deal. More than likely, it's not going to help you on your taxes, even if it's real estate, because the tax code is different when you go outside the states. There's no bonus depreciation on any property outside of the United States. It's under a different depreciation system. So buying a million dollar property in America and a million dollar property in Mexico is going to net you drastic tax differences. On on your US taxes. They want you to keep the money in the borders. Look at oil and gas. Oil and gas as well. If you invest into a domestic oil and gas well, you could utilize those losses against your other sources of income, even though you're not managing it, running it. It's not passive, it's active. They allow active losses in oil and gas to offset your other active income because you're investing in America. You're investing in domestic oil. You don't get that if you go outside the United States. And just with the EV credit, they, they put a mandate that has to be manufactured in the United States to get this credit. So keep looking at the tax code of how they kind of guide you and put these guardrails on the border because they want the money to stay here. And you can save a lot on your US taxes too, as long as you play the game a little bit and know the rules. Now, taxes aren't the only thing when it comes to investing. And this is kind of where I would go with your, you know, investing in Mexico thing. Taxes are secondary. That's my primary job. But yes, it is secondary. Your first priority is wealth building. Taxes are a component of wealth building. If you can go make a million dollars on a property in Mexico and you're only going to make $500,000 on a property in the United States, which one would you pick? The one in the United States is going to have a lot more tax break, but you're going to be way better off with more cash in your pocket, even though you pay more tax because your wealth is growing. Mm. So always make the wise financial move. And then hopefully along those lines to kind of where I go with my clients, what are you passionate about? What do you want to invest in? I want to know that because I want to come alongside your passions and see what tax benefits I can harvest. I don't want to push you into a tax beneficial investment. If you hate it, you can't sleep at night, it drives you nuts. It's not worth saving tax to be in going insane. <laughs> at night, not sleeping. So it's very, I mean, I, I have a lot of clients who own properties overseas. They, they just love it as a vacation. They lifestyle asset kind of thing, and they don't get the major tax benefits, but we have that conversation. I let them know that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What, um, the, the 1031, I've, I've been hearing a lot of uh, conversation around the 1031 staying, going, do we care? Do we not care? Probably a lot of that matters what bonus depreciation does, but what, what's your, what's your thoughts on that long-term? I think it's, I think it's around. If they kill off bonus, my, my, I guess this is my hope. I don't know. I don't have a really <laughs> basis for my thought, but my thought would be as if, if I wanted to completely tank the real estate market in the United States, which I always feel like the IRS is always kind of trying to grow our economy despite their best efforts at times. I feel like that's the main objective and should be the goal of the government. <clears throat> now that doesn't always come true, but if they really want to tank the real estate industry, the bonus is already going away. Why not just ta tack on 1031s going away too? And then all of a sudden there's no tax benefits in real estate anymore. So I would, they would be so stupid to do that. But again, my crystal ball doesn't work, but I would hope that it stays up because it's a, such a terrific way to tax plan because that's the using the 1031 is the only true way to truly eliminate tax only way because when we're talking tax savings, we're typically talking deferment of tax. Mm -hmm. If you get de bonus depreciation, you're just going to pay paying more tax in the future, but you get a lot of tax savings today to redeploy and invest into something else. But in the future years, you got a tax plan every year to keep up. Mm -hmm. With the 1031 exchange, you can 1031 into a property and keep on going in your lifetime. Keep moving. You have to keep moving up in property or else it's going to cause tax, taxable income. But if you keep moving up and let's say you're 70 or 80 and you got a big multifamily unit that you've 1031 would up to from a single family home, then when you pass away and that property goes to your children, that properties, that multifamily complex you now have is going to get what's called a step up in basis. So all that basis that's been reduced via the 1031 exchange now goes away. And now your children can take that apartment complex or multifamily deal and find out what the fair market value is and sell it at its fair market value. And that's their cost basis. They pay no tax. Hmm. And that's the only true way to eliminate tax of how a 1031 works is you just keep 1031ing until you die and it goes to your heirs. 
If ever you take the money out of a property that's been 1031 or multiple properties, that tax liability just keeps following you and following you and following you for property to property until you cash out or you die and then it could be tax free. Yeah. So I love the 1031. It's a great out in real estate, but I mean, it doesn't eliminate the tax unless you die. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there, is there a 1031 for business of any sort? Um, yeah. I mean, you could like 1031 uh, it's, it's just called like a, a trait, like a, like a vehicle you can 1031. It's just kind of like, it's, it's just a light kind exchange. Mm. So you can 1031 different kinds of assets. doesn't have, it's just most popular in real estate, but you could 1031 a, a vehicle. And I mean, I don't know if they really even call it a 1031 exchange is just kind of like a trade-in you know you you reduce the basis by the gain and it's just yeah there should be ways to dice it as long as it's like kind property if i sold a, a plumbing company in nevada and wanted to buy one in texas can i is there something there that's a good question yeah i don't know I know it's a random one. <laughs> that is a random one. I don't know. Um, I had the question just today. Can I 1031 my real estate property into a partnership interest, like a multifamily syndication? My thought without doing massive research is there's always a way you could do a tenant in common or there's got to be some way to structure it. But my initial take is if you 1031 in real estate and you try to go into a syndication, even though your syndication might be real estate, you're really syndicating into a partnership interest that owns real estate. So it may not be considered like kind. That I mean, there's so many. That's where the the code is gray. Where I need to. That's kind of where I need to go to my cave and research. If mm -hmm. I've never come across that specific instance, but my thinking is, if you had stock from you know one plumbing company to another, you probably could equally just go from one stock to another. But yeah, yeah. interesting. Well, you just pointed out something <laughs> that I love about you and Mike and you know people like you. I asked the question and most most CPAs you ask a stupid question like hey can I write off this lunch and they're like no. I ask you like <laughs> I ask you like this curveball question and you're like hmm let me think about that. And yeah. you know I think that's a great lesson for the audience is like if you've got somebody that's just black and white no uh, and I hear this all the time like you can't can't can't. I would rather have somebody like you that says let me go into my cave, let me research this. I'm not going to say yes. But let me go make sure before I tell you no that it's an actual no. So you know I appreciate that about you and Mike, and um, it's just been yeah. it's fun. It's been fun. Yeah, it's up. it's it's a lot of weight on your shoulders if you try to know everything and try to be the smartest guy in the room. It's a lot of pressure and it's a lot of weight. I learned that early early on my career because when you have when you're a CPA or an attorney or you know you're the head of a company, there's a lot of weight there. You have you you have to have the answer. You're where you are because you know everything, and that's humanly impossible. We hire people at our firm that have tremendous gifts and talents in specific areas that I'm not talented in mm -hmm. for that exact reason is if you have a question on partnership taxation, that is definitely Mike's strong suit, partnership taxation. Mine would be the real estate um, construction. You know, we all have our niches, but that's why you have a team around you. And yeah, being the biggest brain in the room is not a brag to me. It's more of an arrogance thing that I always, I hate it. I just, I, I if I'm the smartest guy in the room and it's way in the wrong, I'm in the wrong room period. Yeah. Um, I, I have a thirst for knowledge and a hunger for knowledge and I like to get creative and that's, I think that's a, a strength, I guess. Yeah, I think it is <laughs> for sure. Uh, well, we're, uh, we're approaching the top of the hour. I want to be, you know, cognizant of your time. You've got plenty to do. I'm sure what, if anything, did we not cover that you think the audience should know? And more importantly, how do they get in touch with you? If you know, well, maybe who's the right client and how do they potentially get in touch with you to see if they're a fit? No, great. Uh, my biggest takeaway from a tax side is it, I know taxes can get confusing. It gets confusing for me and I play in taxes all day. It's, it is confusing. It can get overwhelming. It can get you just don't know where to start. Well, a good place to start is if you, like we were talking earlier, if you don't have a professional, just have a consult with one, let them know your situation, be a little vulnerable here. You know, here's, here's what I have. Here's what I don't. Here's where my goals are. Here's where I failed. We want to understand you. And then that way we can advise you. And so just start somewhere. Even if you don't know where, just reaching out, raising a hand to a, to a CPA. Um, if you don't feel like you're getting really proactive advice, uh, which is very common in the CPA world, because um, we're always playing catch up. We're always a year behind, but you need to have that level of attention to you because you're worth it. 
And the more money you save today, the more you can provide for your family in the future, the more you can reinvest, grow our economy, invest in real estate, the government, there's ways to structure it so we can get a refund by just investing in the American properties, so long as you meet the certain guidelines. And that's where you want to start. Just what are you passionate about? Are you doing anything? Are you kind of nose in the head in the ground and you don't want to even bother with it? I'd strongly, strongly push you to not do that. In my opinion, they're incompetent in all, so many levels. So that's what makes our job fun. But if, if you don't have anybody to reach out to, please reach out to me. Uh, you can go to pinecocpas.com. Uh, there you can schedule a consultation. I'll have a free consult with you. And that's kind of what the free consult will be. Just understanding who who you are, what you're passionate about, and how we can help you out. Love it, man. Well, yeah. I know every opportunity I've had to speak with you and and Mike, your your partner has been amazing. You guys have taught me a ton, and um, yeah, just appreciate you know what what you guys are doing for the world and just the representation that you provide for you know us every everyday business owners, people just trying to make a living. Yep, it's hard out there. I mean, being being self employed is not easy, but that's why you have team members. You have a network around you to support you. So, well, I appreciate alone. your time, man. And it's been a great conversation. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. It's been awesome.